Hello and welcome to Keep It Classical. Today we are going to continue to talk about the High Renaissance, but this time from jolly old England. I have a very special connection with the music of England. Between my bachelor's and my master's degree, I had the opportunity to travel abroad to London specifically to study choral music and had a life-changing adventure. Also, according to my 23andMe results, roughly 85% of my ancestry comes from the British Isles. The rest of me is Scandinavian. This, I know this is a huge shock. Anyway, we've got a lot of music to cover, so let's get started. A lot happens in England between Dunstable, who we talked about a while back, and the High Renaissance. But I'll try and keep this as succinct as possible. The drama really starts when Henry VIII tries to divorce his wife, Catherine of Aragon, and marry Anne Boleyn. When the Pope refuses this request, Henry decides to grant himself the power to divorce by making himself the head of a new church, creatively named the Church of England, that his entire kingdom would be a part of, and starts going through wives like their party favors. Henry divorced Catherine and married Anne Boleyn. He then beheaded Anne and married Jane Seymour, who died. Next, he married Anne of Cleves. He then divorced Anne and married Catherine Howard. He then beheaded Catherine Howard and married Catherine Parr. And then Henry VIII died in 1547. <sighs> That's a lot of casualties. That's like Game of Thrones casualties. By the way, the easy way to remember the fates of his wives are divorced, beheaded, died, divorced, beheaded, survived. Now, after Henry VIII died, he was survived by several children, but we're only going to talk about the three that succeeded him. Edward VI, Mary I, and Elizabeth I. Henry VIII started out as a Catholic who became a Protestant, Edward VI was a staunch Protestant, Mary I was a staunch Catholic, and Elizabeth was more of a moderate Protestant. And if you don't think that that caused some drama in England, well, <laughs> think again. Okay, why am I telling you all this? What does any of this have to do with music? Because the monarchs and their religion had a huge effect on the music, and nothing represents this better than the musician who worked for each of these monarchs. Thomas Tallis. Thomas Tallis was born around the year 1505 and started making music during the reign of Henry VIII when he was Catholic, all the way through Elizabeth I. Thomas Tallis worked a few different gigs around England, but he eventually became a gentleman of the Chapel Royal, or Chapel Royale, if that's how you prefer to say it. This is the monarch's personal chapel that travels with them wherever they are, and they're made of gentlemen or the older men who sing alto tenor and bass, and the choristers who sing the soprano. As a gentleman of the Chapel Royale, Talus not only composed music, but sang, played the organ, and helped teach the boys that sang as choristers. He was essentially a working musician for 50 straight years. 50 years! Not everyone in Tudor England even survived 50 years. Besides his absurdly long lifespan, what makes Talus' music so remarkable is that his compositions evolve with each changing monarch. It's important to remember that composers don't compose in a vacuum. Composers and their works will largely reflect the environment that they dwell in, culturally, economically, as well as politically. Talus is a perfect example of that. He writes relatively expansive and epic works in Latin for Henry VIII and Mary I. Edward VI, however, wanted to purge the Church of England from what he considered to be the papish corruptions of his father. He wanted the music of the church to be more modest and in the vernacular, a common theme in other Protestant movements. This meant that instead of Latin motets, we start to see the beginning of the English anthem, a form that is alive and well today. Keep my 
Elizabeth I, she and her country were Protestant, but in her own personal chapel she didn't mind Latin or more elaborate music, and Tallis wrote in a hybrid between the two. So Talus rolls with the punches, writes what is required of him, and gets to stay alive. Like a chameleon, Talus blends himself into whatever he's needed to be. It sounds really stressful, but I get the sense that Talus doesn't get shaken very easily. Indeed, the way he composes music so prolifically during these time periods, it almost seems like he's thriving under the instability. Indeed, he even takes on music students in the Chapel Royale, one of which would surpass his own ability and is considered to be one of the greatest composers that England ever produced, William Byrd. William Byrd was born in London around the year 1540 in what was then Protestant England. Byrd and his two brothers were all choristers, or boy sopranos. His brothers at St. Paul's Cathedral and William at the Chapel Royale. While in the Chapel Royale, he learned music and composition from Thomas Tallis and sang for Queen Mary where he likely converted to Roman Catholicism and this became a sticking point in Byrd's life for the rest of his days. When Queen Elizabeth took the throne, the whole nation goes back to being Protestant. But Byrd, according to all the evidence we have, remains Catholic in spirit. Today, this might not seem like a big deal, but back then, being Catholic, along with singing, saying, or hearing mass, could be considered a treasonous offense and punishable by death. But as mentioned previously, Elizabeth I didn't mind Catholic elements, including Latin, in her own personal chapel, and adored music immensely. She also once said about the differences between the faiths, there is one Lord Jesus Christ, the rest is a dispute about trifles. This works well enough for Bird, who eventually becomes a gentleman of the Chapel Royale, working alongside his mentor, Talis. While both of them enjoyed writing Latin motets and English anthems, they both embraced a peculiar harmonic feature that became common in English music called the cross or false relation. This is where you have two simultaneous sounding pitch classes, but one pitch will be altered chromatically while the other one won't be. It's sort of difficult to explain and way easier to hear. Here's a few cross relations by Thomas Tallis. I've highlighted the parts for you and used arrows to point out which pitches I'm referring to. To our ears, it sounds dissonant, and frankly, it sounds like a mistake. In fact, when this music was rediscovered in the early 20th century, some American publishers took these cross relations out, thinking that they were mistakes. But we know that these aren't mistakes for a few reasons. First, English composers kept doing this over and over and over again. If they were meant to be mistakes, you'd only see a handful of these here and there. But you see these all over the canon of English music during this time, and in very conspicuous places at that. In some pieces you'll find maybe one or two, but in others you'll find several. William Byrd actually took this idea to the extreme in his composition O Salutaris Ostia.
William Byrd also writes three masses, one for three voices, one for four voices, and one for five voices. What's interesting about this music is that each of these feels very clandestine. This music feels like sonic contraband, almost like it's a forbidden pleasure, because in many ways it was. If you're trying to keep your Catholicism a secret, you don't go writing super energetic music. You keep it simple, but very beautiful. Let's listen to an example from his Mass for Four Voices. Bird also begins to explore a new form in English music called the verse anthem. This is different from all the other anthems that we've seen up to this point, which we should now refer to as full anthems. Here are the differences between a full anthem and a verse anthem. Full anthems are compositions with multiple polyphonic voice parts, while verse anthems have sections for solo singers and accompaniment juxtaposed against other sections with a full ensemble. Full anthems generally contain more sections of polyphonic texture, while verse anthems are generally more homophonic. Full anthems only have parts written for the voices and have no explicit instruments, while verse anthems feature independent instrumentation separate from the voices. This instrument, however, will double the vocal parts when the full ensemble enters. Listen for each of these characteristics as we listen to an example, Christ Rising Again. This is an exciting development for a few reasons. First, it explores the idea of contrast. Contrast between the full ensemble and the smaller ensemble, which also explores the contrast between loud and soft, as well as the difference between thin textures and thick textures. 
Second, it explores the idea of the instrument now taking on more of an independent role besides doubling what's written for the voices. We've seen that instruments have been used in church before, but now we're starting to see these parts become separated and treated in a special way, taking on their own role in sacred music. I wish I had more time to explore the rest of Bird's music, and sadly after Queen Elizabeth dies, it only took a generation before England stopped producing as much incredible music. The Cromwells and other Puritans come along and extinguish so much artistic creativity. But England will bounce back, and we'll see a lot of other incredible composers from this area. That's all for now. Thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, consider watching my previous video about two other composers from the High Renaissance, Palestrina and Lasus. And remember, keep it classical.